Hello, I greet you all and welcome you to the Manifested e-learning platform. Today, we are going to uh, start the revision of the December 2023. The subject is auditing and assurance. This paper has five questions. Candidates were required to answer all questions. We will be answering a question at a time. First of all, let us begin with question number 1A, which reads, Describe three roles played by professional bodies in the regulation of auditors. Three roles played. Played by professional bodies in the regulation of auditors. That is question 1A. The first role played by professional bodies like the uh, Institute of Certified Public Accountants or the International Federation of Accountants is setting auditing standards. The first role is setting auditing standards. That is one key role. Professional bodies like the International Federation of Accountants or even national accounting bodies like ISPAC they issue guidelines like international standards on auditing that define best practices for conducting audits and these standards ensure consistency and quality in audit engagement. So the first role is to set auditing standards. Enforcing ethical conduct. These bodies establish and enforce ethical codes that auditors must adhere to. And that promotes integrity and objectivity in their work, contributing to public trust in financial reporting and financial auditing. Three, conducting disciplinary proceedings. Professional bodies have the authority to investigate and discipline members who violate the established standards or ethical codes and that ensures accountability and it maintains the profession's reputation. So these are three roles that are professional bodies play in regulation of auditors. Three marks. Setting auditing standards, number one. Number two, enforcing ethical conduct. Number three, conducting disciplinary proceedings. Three marks. Part B reads, in the context of international standards on auditing number 530, 530, which deals with audit sampling, use relevant examples to distinguish between sampling risk and non-sampling risk, citing relevant examples. We're going to have the two in a table. Distinctions, the distinctions, we have sampling and non-sampling. Sampling and non-sampling. Non-sampling risk. This is sampling risk. What is the distinction between the two? Now, when defining or distinguishing terms, you can distinguish best, first of all, on definition. If you to define sampling risk and define non-sampling risk, that definition will bring out one distinction. So, what is sampling risk? Now, sampling risk, candidates, is the risk that the auditor's conclusion based on the sample may be different. One, it is the risk that the auditor's conclusion may be different from the sample. Do you understand? Sampling risk is the risk that the auditor's conclusion based on the sample may be different from the, con uh, the conclusion of the entire population. May be different from the conclusion of the entire population may be different from 
the conclusion of the entire population. Sampling risk. Do you understand? It is the risk, I repeat, that the auditor's conclusion based on a sample may be different from the conclusion if the entire population was subjected to the same audit procedure. It arises due to the inherent variability in the characteristics of the population being sampled. So if an auditor was to take, say, 30 invoices as a sample from a population of a thousand invoices, and the auditor concludes that out of the 30, after going through the 30 invoices, he does not find any error out of the 30. He may conclude that all the invoices, the 1,000 invoices, do not have any errors. So a sampling error arises where the auditor concludes that, that based on the sample, the conclusion based on the sample is uh, accurate, but the sampling risk arises. The sampling risk arises if the entire population is subjected to the audit procedure is different from what the auditor concluded out of the sample of 30 invoices. That is the sampling risk. But the non-sampling risk, candidates, non-sampling risk, which is also referred to as non-sampling error, encompasses all other risks associated with the audit procedures. Encompasses, this is a risk that encompasses all other risks that arises from the, the entire audit process. Do you understand? It encompasses all other risks associated with the entire audit process. With the entire audit process and shortly we'll be giving examples so non-sampling risk these are risks that are not associated with sampling but associated or encompasses all other risks that are associated with the audit process or with the audit procedures that are not attributable uh, 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 that cannot be attributed to the sampling uh, process they are not related to the sampling process but they compass all other risks associated with all other audit procedures and it includes factors that may lead to errors or biases in the audit process regardless of the sample size or selection even if the auditor was to um, uh, take the whole population non-sampling risk may still arise so that is the first distinction the second distinction between sampling risk and non-sampling risk is that sampling risk is specific to the sampling process. It is specific to the sampling process. Sampling risk is strictly associated with the sampling process. Whereas non-sampling risk is broad and encompasses 
various factors unrelated to sampling. This one is unrelated. It is broad and it is unrelated to sampling. That is the nature of non sampling risk. It is broad and unrelated to sampling. It is broad and encompasses various factors unrelated to sampling, affecting the reliability of the uh, audit procedures. Another distinction between the two is that sampling risk arises due to inherent um, variability in the population being sampled. Arises due to inherent variability. Sampling risk arises to, due to the inherent variability in the population. Due to the inherent variability in the population. The characteristics vary. They are varied. Whereas non-sampling risk arises from errors arises from errors it arises from biases it arises from uncertainties so non sampling risk arises from errors from biases from uncertainties in the audit procedure or audit process you understand it could be also uh, uncertainties arising from data collection from analysis from interpretation and so on now the question required candidates also give some examples so we're going to give a few examples of some risk and a few examples of non-sampling risk number four One example could be in relation to small, small sample size. If the auditor selects a very small sample size or small number of transactions to review, there is a higher risk of missing significant errors or fraud. If the auditor was to, to select, say, just 1% of uh, say uh, a thousand invoices or 10 percent or five percent a small sample size if an auditor selects a very small sample size there is a high chance that there will be a significant sampling error or risk Another example could be non-representative sample. Non-representative non-representative sample. Non-representative sample. The chosen sample candidates might not be proportional to the actual population. For example, focusing only on larger transactions could overlook errors in the smaller transactions. If you are talking about invoices, uh, not it only concentrating on invoices that range in millions of shillings and in go ignoring those that range in thousands. There could be no errors in the larger invoices, but there could be errors in the smaller invoices. So that is what I'm referring to as non-representative sample. It can bring about uh, sampling risk. There is also sample error. Sample error. These are statistical fluctuations that can lead to situations where the sample results differ slightly from 
the true uh, uh, the true population values. So these are examples of risk sampling risks. Then non sampling risk candidates, there could be examples like auditor error. Auditor error. These are mistakes made by the auditor during testing, such as miscalculations, uh, overlooking uh, red flags, or misinterpreting uh, uh, accounting standards. That is an, an example of an unsampling error. Inadequate procedures. Inadequate procedures. This means using inappropriate audit procedures that fail to detect existing and um, or misstatements, existing misstatements. Where an auditor uses uh, inadequate procedures, that could lead, that could be an example of non-sampling uh, error, inadequate procedures. You may also have management bias. That means the possibility of management intentionally manipulating information or withholding crucial details from the auditor. We can cite other examples like model risks. That is, if the auditor uses flawed analytical tools or um, models to assess risks, so those are some of the examples. You can cite more examples like the data, uh, data processing errors and so on. So we've, we've uh, distinguished the two, sampling risk one. We have number two. We've said that sampling risk is specific to the sampling process. Here we say that non sampling risk is broad and and related to sampling. Number three, we have made a distinction here based on the cause. Number three, the first distinction is based on the definition. Definition. The second distinction is based on the nature. Nature. You said it is specific to the sampling process. Number three is distinction based on cause. What causes sampling error? What causes non-sampling risk? We say that sampling risk arises due to inherent variability in the population, whereas non-sampling risk arises from errors, biases, uncertainties in the audit procedures. So these are three distinctions. We have given examples. The question required candidates to cite examples which you have done. That is question number one uh, B Roman one. B Roman one four marks. Then moving on to B Roman two, highlight three strategies that an audit firm may use to control non sampling risk which we've defined here as the risk that encompasses all other risks associated with the entire audit process. We say that it is unrelated to sampling. So one strategy to control non-sampling risk is to have proper audit planning and procedures. Proper audit uh, planning and procedures. The auditor should put in place proper audit planning and procedures conducting thorough risk assessments, understanding the client's business, and also designing appropriate audit procedures can help reduce the risk of non-sampling errors or even um, misinterpretations. So an auditor should begin by first of all, understanding the client's business, conducting thorough risk assessments, and also designing proper audit uh, planning and procedures that can minimize occurrences of non-audit errors or risks. Another strategy is 
competence 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 and quality control what do i mean by competence now the audit should ensure that the audit team possesses the necessary skills and expertise for the engagement and also implementing robust quality control uh, procedures that can minimize mistakes that can minimize omissions and so on so one way to avoid errors non sampling these are uh, errors we saw here examples auditor error inadequate procedures management bias these are causes to avoid these uh, errors then the auditor should ensure that the audit team is properly equipped competent enough skilled to handle audit engagements that will reduce or control sampling risks the third strategy is audit supervision and review audit supervision and audit review the audit firm should have experienced reviewers and supervisors who can oversee the audit work and then help identify and address potential non sampling errors and thereby, and thereby um, uh, controlling non sampling risks or errors audit supervision and review having experienced reviewers and supervisors who can oversee the audit work can help to identify and address potential non sampling errors uh, before they affect the final conclusions these are three strategies candidates were to give three strategies three strategies proper audit planning and procedures competence and quality control audit supervision and review three marks Part C, I read, Biggie Furniture Limited is a high-end office furniture and equipment company. The company has grown tremendously in its customer base in recent years and apart from selling furniture and equipment, it, has now, it, it now has a maintenance and leasing department. The company has an elaborate internal audit function to enhance the internal control system. Biggie Furnitures Limited has appointed you as the external auditor and requested you to cooperate with the company internal auditor to keep the total audit costs down. The company would like you to rely on the work of the internal auditor. The internal auditor provides the following services to the company. One, an audit of operations of internal controls in the company's major fu uh, functions, including operations, customer support, and information services. Two, a review of the structure of internal controls in major in each major function every four years three an annual review of the effectiveness of measures put in place by the management to minimize the major risks facing the company in the year being audited the company has had a major internal restructuring in its information service function the internal auditor was closely involved in the preparation of the plan for the restructuring and in the related post implementation review required roman one explain the extent to which you will seek to rely on the work of the internal auditor in each of the operational areas of biggie furnitures limited six marks roman two describe four circumstances in which it would not be possible for the an external auditor to rely on the work of the internal auditor described four circumstances in which it would not be possible for an external auditor to rely on the work of the internal auditor four marks 
that is part C. So you have been appointed. Big Limited has appointed you as the external auditor and requested you to cooperate with the company internal auditor to keep the total co audit costs down. So the question is, you as an external auditor, to what extent are you going to rely on the work of this internal auditor? That is the question. extent of reliance of an external auditor on the work of an internal auditor in operational areas. So we have operations, number one, operations. Because we read in this question that the company has grown tremendously, just a maintenance and a leasing department. The company has an elaborate internal function to enhance internal controls. The auditor provides the following services to the company. One, audit of operations. So operations, to what extent are you going to rely on this internal auditor as far as operations are concerned? Now here, an internal auditor, as an internal auditor, you can rely on, you can significantly rely on the work of the internal auditor. I will or can significantly rely on the work of the internal auditor. I will significantly. The question is, to what extent? So, as far as operations is concerned, it is to a significant extent. Significantly. Why? Because, candidates, if you read the first bullet, the internal auditor provides the following services to the company. And audit of operations of internal controls in the company's major uh, functions, um, operations, customer support, and information. The auditor provides services as far as the operations are concerned. The auditor regularly audits the controls in operations. And that provides assurance regarding transaction processes and inventory management because the internal auditor carries out this work on operations regularly. There is regular audits of controls in operations. But be that as it may, as an auditor, I will perform additional procedures in areas that are, that are considered high risk, such as cash handling and procurement. So I will significantly rely on the work of an internal auditor in operations because the auditor performs regular audits and reviews of operations. However, I will not significantly rely on the internal auditor's work in high risk areas like handling of cash. So that is operations. The question is, explain the extent to which you rely on the auditor in each of the operational areas. So one is operations, the other area is customer support. To what extent? Will I rely on the internal auditor's work as far as customer support is concerned? Customer support. What do we, information do we have on customer support? Uh, there is an audit of operations of in the company's customer support and 
information services. All right. So for customer support candidates, I will partly rely on the work of the internal auditor. I will partly. Here it was significantly. That was the extent. The extent on my reliance on the internal auditor's work as far as customer support is concerned is partly. I will partly rely on the work of the internal auditor. I'll partly rely on the work of the internal auditor's uh, reviews. Why? Because there hasn't been any recent audit focusing on customer support. We've not read anything here on customer support. We've just read that the company has grown tremendously in its customer base in recent years. And apart from selling furniture, it has now maintenance and leasing department. The company has an elaborate internal audit function to enhance internal controls you've been appointed. The company would like you to rely on the work of the auditor. So I would partly rely on the work of the internal auditor as far as customer support is concerned because there is no information as to uh, any recent audit focusing on customer support. So then candidates, that means that I will perform extensive testing of controls regarding customer data, regarding complaints handling, regarding uh, matters to do with the um, revenue recognition and so on. Any matter related to the customers, I will carry out test of controls and uh, come up with my own observations and audit evidence. Number three, we have information services. Information services. Here candidates, I will not rely on any, on the work of the internal auditor as far as information services is concerned. Why? Because we've read that there has been a restructuring due to the recent restructuring and internal auditors um, uh, involvement because the internal auditor has been involved in restructuring because of the recent restructuring and the internal auditor's involvement in the restructuring, I'll have limited reliance on the internal auditor's work. Due to recent restructuring. We read here that, that uh, in the year being audited, the company has had a major restructuring in its information services in its information services, all right? The internal auditor was closely involved in the preparation of the plan for restructuring and in the related post implementation. As an internal auditor, I cannot rely on the internal auditor's work as far as information services is concerned because he's the one who has been involved in the restructuring process, has been closely involved. It will be like self-review. The external auditor cannot rely on the work of the auditor because you see the work of an internal auditor is to carry out independent examination of the internal control system. But when this restructuring was taking place, he was one helping in the restructuring. And therefore, the internal, internal auditor's work cannot be relied upon by the external auditor. And therefore, as an external auditor, I'll need to perform my own comprehensive uh, independent procedures to assess the effectiveness of the new controls and also, ad and, and also address any potential risks arising from the restructuring. Do you understand? The question read, to wh what extent will the external auditor 
rely on the work of an internal auditor and there were three um, areas one is operations the first part on operations i say that i will significantly rely on the work of the internal auditor and i gave reasons because the auditor regularly reviews this area of operations the second area is customer support i said i will partly rely on the work of the internal auditor and i gave reasons partly because there is no information to show that there is any work that the auditor has been doing on customer support as opposed to operations in note number three information services the internal auditor has been taking was involved in the restructuring process and therefore as an external auditor i'll not i'll have limited reliance so candidates you are here in this question describing the levels of reliance the question read extent of reliance to what extent will the external auditor rely on the work of the internal auditor the first part is significant reliance number two partly reliance then lastly limited reliance and i've cited the reasons so that will earn how many marks the marks are six marks six marks two marks Two marks, two marks total, six marks. The last part of this question reads, describe four circumstances in which it would not be possible for an external auditor to rely on the work of the internal auditor. What may limit an external auditor from relying on the work of an internal auditor? one is lack of independence now as much as an internal auditor is an employee of the company the department or the individual in charge of the internal audit function ought to have some level of independence that can allow the office of the internal audit uh, function to carry out its work without any influence or coercion from the management. So if the internal auditor reports to management or is involved in operational activities, then their objectives their objectivity, the objectivity of such an individual would be compromised, limiting reliance on their work. If the internal auditor, I repeat, reports to management, that means is an individual who may have been uh, hired by the management, he reports to the management. or is involved in operational activities apart from auditing is given assignments like accounting functions or responsibilities then such an internal auditor cannot be independent such a person lacks independence and he cannot be objective in his work, meaning that his objectivity could be compromised, leading to limited reliance. So this is one circumstance where an internal auditor lacks independence, then there can only be limited reliance on his work by the external auditor.
inadequate, let me just say, incompetence. Incompetence. Meaning, lack sufficient skills or experience, then their work may not meet professional standards, necessitating independent procedures. If you are an auditor, an external auditor of a firm, where the internal audit team is not competent, meaning it lacks the necessary skills and expertise, then do not rely on the work. Three, insufficient documentation. Insufficient documentation. Insufficient documentation. If internal audit work lacks proper documentation or supporting evidence, then its reliability cannot be verified. And then, and therefore, and therefore, independent testing becomes necessary. So if you work for, or you audit a firm whose internal audit department does not have sufficient documentation, then do not rely on the work of that uh, department. You would rather have your own independent testing. Four, significant risks that have been identified. If the external auditor identifies major risks, particularly in areas of uh, um, internal controls, right, or areas not recently reviewed by the internal audit, then independent procedures are crucial for obtaining sufficient audit evidence. So these are four circumstances in which it would be po not be possible for an internal auditor to rely on the work of the internal auditor. One, lack of independence. Two, lack of skills. Three, insufficient uh, documentation. Four, significant identified risks. Four marks. Four marks. So we have 10 marks, 4 plus 6 plus 3 plus 4 plus 3 adds to 20 marks. And that brings the lesson to an end. We've answered question 1 from the December 2023 sitting. In our next session, we are going to answer question 2. Thank you for attending the lesson. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Both partners were accomplished entrepreneurs and were officials of the County Chamber of Commerce, which greatly assisted these members in generating business ideas. The partnership converted into a private company in the year 2015 as a result of a significant business growth. Peter and Patrick were the first directors of MWRPL. When the partnership converted into a private company, the directors moved their head office from Murungaru, a small town in Yandaro County, to Nairobi County. The second paragraph reads, the two were involved in the day-to-day -day run of their company through, though they were board members. Peter was the chairman of the board of directors, while Patrick was the chief executive officer. Patrick was responsible for operations in the company. Peter was responsible for leadership, marketing, and human resource, in addition to carrying out the chairman's role. These are times brought about confusion in the company leading to bad decisions. Paragraph 3. Due to the complexities associated with the shift from partnership to a company and the confusion in decision making, MWRPL hired the services of Mamlaka Management Consultancy, MMCC, to assist in establishing working structures and recruitment of relevant key personnel. Before the consultant came on board, the business had a workforce of 67 employees, a few work, working on permanent basis while majority were engaged on temporary contracts. Paragraph 4. The consultants analyzed the defunct partnership business to establish strengths and weaknesses and recommended a divisional structure. They also advised that all the employees who were retained by the business after conversion into a company for them to change their mindset. MCC also recommended to MWRPL to recruit new employees in order to fill identified skill gaps. The consultants insisted that the staff recruited be upped in intuition, technology, data collection, analysis, and dissemination of information to ensure decisions in the company were mainly arrived at scientifically. The new employees were to focus on both internal and in external matters affecting the company. Next paragraph. The company's main objective as stated in its memorandum of association was to offer wood and roofing products in the country. The company segmented its market by offering tailor-made solutions to two classes of customers, furniture for homeowners, and roof construction for the construction industry. The company adopted diverse marketing as its primary marketing strategy. Next paragraph. Most of the company's operations took a job shop approach. For each segment, the company worked on one project at a time before moving to the next project. Project scheduling skills were necessary to the production managers so as to ensure customer orders were completed on time. This ensured high levels of customer satisfaction. Next paragraph. To continuously improve the quality of its products, MWRPL invested heavily in technology and customer service. A slogan was devised and circulated, think and delight the customer. That was a slogan, think and delight the customer. Improved quality of its products and services has resulted into lowering of the production cost. As compared to the competitors, the market now offers, now prefers MWRPL's products due to quality and affordability. Next paragraph. The company diversified its services to capture new customers and markets. In year 2021 and after carrying out an environmental analysis, MWRPL noted an opportunity through its research and marketing department and included solar applicants and, and included solar appliances in its products offering. This targeted low income earners in rural areas who are not connected to national electricity power grid. The last paragraph reads, by mid-2022, the demand for the wood products and roofing services had exponentially expanded 
with the company's clientele being spread in all the 47 countries in the county country the company has expanded these operations and services and has opened branches in all east african countries the company has future plans of opening branches in western african in west african countries required a explain why the following are important to the company roman one internal analysis roman two external analysis b the county chamber of commerce assisted these members in generating ideas discuss five techniques that could have been used by the members to generate business ideas 10 marks c analyze five characteristics of organization structure recommended by mamlaka management consultancy five marks d Despite being board members, Peter and Patrick were involved in the day-to-day -day running of their company leading to bad decisions. With reference to the above statement, analyze four inhibitors to effective decision making, eight marks. E, MWRPL adopted a reverse marketing as its primary marketing Proposed to the company seven strategies that they could use while developing a diverse marketing campaign, seven marks. F, MWRPL's production managers were expected to possess project scheduling skills in order for them to be effective. Highlight six contents they could have included in their project schedules. Six marks, total 40 marks. So candidates, you are first going to answer the first part of this question. Part A, which reads, explain why the following are important to MWRPL. Roman 1, internal analysis. Roman 2, external analysis. What is the importance of internal analysis? Now, the purpose for conducting internal analysis or the way to conduct internal analysis is to, to evaluate or gauge the strengths and weaknesses of a company strengths and weaknesses an internal analysis helps the analyzer to an understand the internal strengths which include uh, skilled workforce mm -hmm. strong customer satisfaction those are two examples of strength there are also weaknesses like um, in this company there was a weakness on confusing decision making process that is a weakness, all right? There could also be other weaknesses like having uh, poor infrastructure, uh, outdated assets, and so on. So the purpose for carrying an internal analysis is in order to understand strengths and weaknesses. That is one reason why internal analysis is conducted understand the company's strengths and weaknesses so that uh, uh, the company can leverage its strengths and address weaknesses to improve efficiency and growth. So the purpose for conducting internal analysis is to identify the strengths that the company has so that the company can leverage on its strengths and uh, internal analysis also conducted to, to, to identify the weaknesses the company has so that strategies can be put in place to mitigate these weaknesses, to address the weaknesses in order to improve efficiency and growth. That's the one reason for conducting internal analysis. Another reason is to effectively allocate resources effective resource allocation. Identifying internal resources and capabilities can help a company like this one, MWRPL, to allocate resources like technology, like talent, effectively, in order to support the current and, and future expansion plans. So internal analysis can help a company to effectively allocate resources. Another reason 
is in relation to risk management. Internal analysis reveals potential internal risks like the management structure issues we read in this question, that's an example. We have uh, issues related to reliance on specific employees and risk analysis, I mean risk management, can also enable this company to implement strategies to mitigate them. So risk is first of all identified, then as a result of internal analysis to identify risks, uh, me measures can be put in place to mitigate such risks. We saw in this company, this company heavily depends on the two directors. We saw the directors of the company are also engaged in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. That is risky because in the event the director is not present, the company may not operate effectively. So it is risky. Reliance on specific employees, as is in the case of this company, is risky. So uh, an internal analysis can help identify such risks and then measures are put in place to mitigate or strategies can be implemented to mitigate the risks. So these are three reasons for conducting internal analysis. How about external analysis? What is the importance of external analysis? That is the second part of the question. Now, external analysis is the is the is the um, process of scanning the external environment. And one reason is to identify opportunities and threats. To identify market opportunities. An external analysis is conducted to identify market opportunities and threats. You understand? Like this company's success relies on understanding market trends understanding competitor strategies and so on. That can only be done, you can only understand competitor strategy and understand the trends in the market after carrying out an external analysis or scanning the external environment. So identifying opportunities like this company identified opportunities in uh, the area of solar, we read that the company diversified its services to capture new customers and markets in year 2021 and after carrying out an environmental analysis. The company noted an opportunity through its research and marketing department and included solar appliances in its product offering. It is after conducting an external analysis that the company can know if there are any opportunities in the external environment. So I've given an example of this um, solar appliances that the company started selling to customers in the market. So one reason why external analysis is conducted is to identify market opportunities and also threats in the market. Do you understand? Another reason is related to economics. Economic and regulatory landscape. Understanding the economic and regulatory landscape. Staying aware of economic changes and the evolving regulations like environmental uh, policies helps a company like MWRPL to adapt its strategies and maintain compliance. There is also an analysis is conducted to understand the competitive landscape. Analyzing strengths and weaknesses of the competitors can inform this company um, um, about product differentiation strategies and also ensure competitive pricing and quality. A company cannot effectively co compete if it does not know what 
the competition is all about. If it does not know the strategies of the competitors. So by conducting external analysis, a company can get information about the pricing, about the quality of competition so that it can adjust its products, so that it can differentiate its products and so on. So these are the reasons why internal analysis and external analysis is conducted. Candidates were to give two points each. I've given you three points each. Importance of internal analysis, one, two, three. External analysis, one, two, three.